All right, looking at the, uh, toward the bottom of page, bottom of page 66, um, letter B. We spent quite a bit of time, spent quite a bit of time last week talking at, uh, talking about the matter of, of the uh, um, dress. And, uh, and by the way, that's, a lot of what I shared with you last week is, are, is some things that I did not know until fairly recently, like, for example, the origin of what's called Sunday dress and, and uh, things of that nature. I would make, I would, and I don't remember if I said this last week or not, um, and if I didn't, I should have. Um, the origin of a thing does not necessarily make a thing wrong somewhere down the road. In other words, the, in other words the, the origin of Sunday dress was a means of division, separating the, you know, we talked about, you know, at one, at, for, you know, for, up until the last, look, up until the last 75 or 80 years, there was really no such thing as a middle class anywhere. It was upper class, and then everybody that was living hand to, you know, week to week, hand to mouth, and so and so with the the advent uh, the advent of Sunday dress uh, was a was designed to separate those who were in the upper crust from, uh, as Brother Woodson used to say, the lesser lights, and uh, and so the origin of it was divisive. Uh, but that does not make that does not make it divisive today, okay? Because things, in other words, in other words, you know, did anybody here know the origin of Sunday dress before I mentioned it last week? Had anybody had anybody ever heard the origin? Well, see, the, no. So what what had we what had we always heard about Sunday dress? Well, we're just trying to do our best for the Lord, and that's a good thing. And so, so, in other words, the origin of the thing was completely unknown to all of us. And, and all we knew was we, we were taught this because we wanted to give our best to the Lord. And certainly nothing in the world wrong with that. And, you know, it's kind of like, uh, kind of like, uh, well, for example, you know, some of what we call holidays, like Christmas or, or Halloween or Easter, you know, the origins of those things are pagan. But that doesn't make that doesn't make the the, ob, the observance of those things associated with paganism today, right? In other words, the pagan you know the origins of Christmas are pagan. They're 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 not Christian. Uh, it was a it, you know it was the co-opting of paganism by Catholicism, and, and but but in other words, but you can celebrate Christmas today without any connections to paganism. A lot of the days, of the, you know, the days of the week, the names of the days of the week are pagan in their origin, and yet, you know, you don't uh, you don't associate those names with paganism. In fact, some of you may not even have known that that the, the that the names of the, our days of the week have pagan origins, and, and but that doesn't mean that just because I say just because I say Thursday uh, or use the word Thursday that I'm in any way associating myself or anyone else with uh, with the god of war, which is Thor. It's Thor's day, and so and so I want to make just make it clear that just because the Sunday dress has its has divisive and unchristian like origins, it doesn't mean that giving our best for the Lord is divisive today or associates itself with that. Uh, and so, but I also, again, I made clear last week that I would never want to do a thing, uh, even if I thought I was honoring God by that thing, I wouldn't want to f make someone feel excluded. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the sermon, uh, in my Lord willing, in, in our sermon study uh, this morning. So I just wanted to make that clear. All right, now, secondly, or back to the, the main part, which is letter B. Talking about biblical reverence, that, that biblical reverence honors God with speech. Honors God with speech. In other words, what we say and, and how we say it. Uh, again, there's a no, and, and this is something that goes, this is something that goes back, um, you know, basically it goes back to the advent of modern day of modern day translations. 
In other words, your King James and your American Standard Bibles all use Elizabethan English. You know, all they all read like Shakespeare, basically like Shakespeare. Why? Well, because Shakespeare lived in the 17th century and the King James was translated in the 17th century. And the language in which the King James was translated was the everyday language of those people. They talk like that. And so, and so with, with, that, with that in mind, with that in mind, the, the advent of what we call modern day translations, which probably started in the late 50s with the uh, Revised Standard, uh, with the Revised Standard version, and then the New American Standard came out in 63, uh, the NIV in 73, um, the New King James, I think, in 83 or 79, somewhere in there, where the, uh, where the verbs and whatnot that were being used did not all end with E-T-H. You know, it did, you know, it didn't say, it didn't say blesseth, it said, you know, blessed. Well, a lot of people that, you know, as, as most everybody in this room did, that cut their teeth on the King James thought that the, uh, many people thought that such language was not reverent. That, it, that in other words, if I want to be reverent, then I have to use the language of the King James Bible because anything else is just not, just not reverent. And of course, that ignores a number of things. First of all, that that's the way people talked back then. In other words, th there was nothing reverent about the language of the King James Bible. In other words, the 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 the, the odd uh, verb endings, or you know, and the odd pronouns, thee and thy and thou and and ye and you know, those things those things were not intended for reverence. That's the way people talk. And so to get away from those things is also not irreverent. And yet, by the way, uh, you know, a guy that I, that I really leaned on a lot in my early preaching and, and questions, uh, and, and many of you will recognize the name Guy N. Woods. Well, in, in his book, in his first, it's his first volume, which is called Questions and Answers, uh, Woods made the statement that it was more reverent to use the old words than it is to use the new words. And he's just as wrong as he can be. That's just as wrong as you can be. And by the way, I know at least up until recently, at, at least one, at least one of the preaching schools that I know uh, taught the use of the old Elizabethan English as basically as a prayer language. In other words, they, they strongly encourage their students to use that kind of language. And again, I totally disagree with that. You know, you know, God, wants, God wants us to pray to Him. You know, people prayed to God in their own language, using their own verbs and their own, you know, their own nouns or pronouns in the 1600s. And those are not the same words that we use in the 2000s. And God, and God is not concerned with, with whether or not I'm using the words that I can find in the King James Bible when I pray. Now look, sometimes, like for example, sometimes when I pray, I'll go back, I'll go back and forth between, between the two. And there, by the way, there's no rhyme or reason to it. So a lot of it will go to the fact that what did I hear for the first 40 years of my life? You know, some of the Bible verses you hear me quote will be a mixture of the King James and or and the and the New King James, and there's no rhyme or reason. It's just however it manages to come out. But one is no less reverent than the other, and so we don't want to get. And look, by the way, if, if a person feels comfortable using the old what we call the old English, the Elizabethan English, more power to them. It, it doesn't bother me for people to to do that. It doesn't bother me. Uh, it bothers me if somebody says I got to do it because I'm pretty sure I can't find that in my Bible anywhere. You know, when somebody can show me the verse that says I got to pray like Shakespeare, then I'll start praying like Shakespeare. But but until then, I'll pray using the words that come that come out of my my head. You know, and, and whichever and however they come out, and so it's not and so it's not dis. And by the way, John's not making that argument. Here at all, I'm just saying those are some things that that I have heard through the years that I think are are not 
helpful at all. Uh, but, uh, but reverence does honor God with speech. Uh, you know, I, think we, I think we should pray, again, using the words that, that we're comfortable with. Uh, and so uh, with that in mind, uh, there's a, a note here. Uh, not a note, but in the middle of this little old paragraph, it says, the loss, this is the end of the second line, the loss of reverence today is seen in prayers offered to daddy. And the word daddy's in quotes, and that's be a word that somebody would use in prayer. By the way, I have heard that. I have heard that. I heard it come out of the mouth of an elder in 1991. And I got to tell you something, it was jarring. It was jarring to hear somebody, to hear somebody, you know, approach the throne of God using that type of terminology. Now, but I will tell you this: you know, there's a passage in the New Testament. There's a passage in the New Testament. Uh, I believe it's in the book of Galatians that where it says that God, uh, in Romans eight, that uh, God has sent His Spirit into our hearts, whereby we cry, "Abba, Father." And the word "Abba," if I understand it correctly, is is the is the term of endearment for God. So there may be some there may be some legitimacy to it. I'll just tell you, but I couldn't find it. I don't like it. And knowing the guy that I did, knowing the guy that I heard use it, it was just it was just somebody pushing the envelope. It's all boiled down to he's just pushing the envelope, you know, trying to trying to be novel, trying to you know be cutting edge or you know progressive or or or, or whatever. Uh, because there were a lot of things about that guy's life, and he was an elder in the church. There were a lot of things about that guy's life that led me to believe that God wasn't his daddy. You know what I mean by that? In other, word, in other words, he did, his life didn't indicate to me that he had a relationship with God that was so close that would warrant that kind of language. That's what I mean by that. All right? And so, and so we need to be respectful. We need to be reverent. Uh, and, by, and by reverent, I just, I, I get, I, just the same way of saying uh, respectful. Uh, you know, we need to recognize who it is we're talking to. Um, you know, you know, who, you know, who it, you know, we need to recognize that you know, it, it's not the mayor, it's not the governor, it's not the president, it's the God of heaven. And I think our language at least needs to reflect an, an idea of we have some idea of, of whom it is we are addressing. And so uh, uh, I also thought about some things um, that... We honor God sometimes with our speech in what we do not say. Let me give you an example of this. It's been, it's probably been four or five years ago now. Uh, when we have the opportunity, Dave, my brother-in-law and I, go to a little local golf course there in Arnold named Palmy Creek. And it's just a nice little old public golf course. And, you know, and just, you know, Look, all your great, you know, your really good golfers don't go play Palmy Creek, okay? Because it's, you know, it's just an average, what they call a muni, municipal course. You know, all your good golfers are members of country clubs or whatever. So, you know, when me and Dave go, we're among our people because we're not very good. Well, we were down there one day getting ready to tee off, and this guy comes up, and he's playing by himself. And he says, you guys mind if I play with you? It's like, no, play, you know, come on. We'll, we'll say, we're going to warn you we're not very good. And he's kind of like, okay, well, I'm not that good either. And he was telling the truth. So we were all about equally bad. Okay, a lot of bad shots hit in that round of golf. All right, but when we finished, and by the way, you have to remember, this is St. Basic. When I say Arnold, I'm talking about St. Louis. This is Metro St. Louis, all right? You're talking about a vast majority of the people in that part of the world, even even worse than it is here, you know, just curse like sailors. You know, they drink. You know, they they curse. They just, you know, they're just not the kind of people you want to hang out with. Now we got done playing. I said, Dave. I said, did you did you notice anything about that guy we were playing with? He said, Nope. He said, What are you talking about? 
I said, out of all the bad shots he hit, he never said one curse word the whole round. Now, that would have been something you would have expected to hear. In, in other words, what, by what he didn't say, by what he didn't say, he made an impression. And I don't know if, I don't know a thing, I've never, I couldn't even tell you his first name. Don't know a thing about him. But I know one thing, that guy didn't curse when he hit a bad golf shot. And I know that most guys, when they hit a bad golf shot, they'll let go of a string of them. And what, what I'm saying by that is, is that, is that sometimes by the words that we don't use, we can, uh, we honor, we honor God. You know, and it, look, it may have just been the case that he, that, you know, he saw me and Dave hit enough bad ones and we didn't curse that he thought, well, you know what? These guys don't curse. I'm not going to curse. It might have been the case if it, if, if, if it had been another situation, he might have. But whatever it was, he never, he never said anything, you know, out, you know, out of the way. And it, it made an impression on me. And so, you know, sometimes we can honor God and reverence God by the speech that we don't use. And so we want to make sure we honor God by the speech that we use, but also understanding we can honor God uh, with the speech uh, that we do not use. And then uh, letter C, bottom of page uh, 66, that biblical reverence honors God with first fruits. Now that first fruits comes from, as a general rule, comes from Proverbs 3 and verse number 9. It says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. In other words, and the key, the key word there is the word first. The key word is the word first. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. In other words, if we were going to use it, if we were going to use the, just speak and say in our, in our terminology, is that, is that God deserves our giving to be off of my gross and not off of my net. Off my gross and not all, off of my net. Because the net is after the government gets his slice, right? Well, again, who's more important? God or government? Well, obviously, God is more important, and so, and by the way, even what the government gets out of out of our pockets every single week is still part of our first fruit. In other words, or not first fruit, it's still part of what we've been blessed with. I mean, we need to, you know, we we don't normally think in these terms, but you know, there's a sense there's a sense in which we're blessed to pay taxes because that means you got something. You know, you know you've, you've worked and you've, you've earned a thing and you've got something. You know, and, and the fact that you have enough to pay taxes it is in of itself a blessing. doesn't mean we necessarily like it or that we think that we, or that we do, think that we, well, we do. We pay too much in our taxes. But the point of the matter is that, that even that, what the government takes is still part of our blessings that God has given us. In other words, just because the government stole it before we got our paycheck on Friday, you know, by withholdings, doesn't mean that that amount is still not a blessing, still not a blessing from God. And so we need to learn to give God off the, the true first fruits of what, you know, of what we make, of what we make. And then, and then, you know, whatever Uncle Sam decides to take, and then, you, you know, you, then you live on the rest. Uh, another problem I've seen in the church through the years is, is that 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 people they give after all their bills have been paid. In other words, the government got his part, and then I, here's my house payment and my car payment and my electric bill and and this and this, and then I've got you know I started with this and I have this left, and I get I give I give out of this I give out of this as opposed to out of this. You know, it, it, and by the way, if most people worked that way, they wouldn't give at all because most people don't even save any money, much less, you know, have any left over. You know, my giving needs to come first. In other words, my giving, my giving comes before I figure out what kind of house I'm going to buy. 
what kind of or build or what kind of car I'm going to drive or, or where I go on vacation or, or whatever. You know, giving has to come first. If giving does, if, if that giving, if my giving does not reflect first fruit giving, then first and foremost, it can't be, it can't in any way be considered a sacrifice. You know, giving is, giving is a sacrifice. Um, you know, our giving should change, should change in some meaningful way the way that we live. You know, it's, you know if, if, if my life would not be significantly changed, for, let's just say, for example, I'll just use me and Ron. If, if Ron and I just quit going to church tomorrow, and we, thus we, we quit giving, you know, if my, if my life would not be significantly changed by having the money in my pocket that I would normally give on Sunday, then my giving is not really a sacrifice, you see. And that's what first fruit giving, that's what first fruit giving is about. Uh, I always think about uh, First Chronicles 29, 14. You know, David, David, as he was making preparations, you know, we always talk about, you know, Solomon built the temple. Solomon built the temple. But David gave him the plans for the temple. Matter of fact, God gave David the plans for the temple, and David gave Solomon the plans for the temple. And David prepared the gold and the silver and the brass and the materials. David started gathering those things. The Bible says, David prepared abundantly before his death. In other words, Solomon got off to a really good start in, in the building of the temple because David had been laying up, laying up for the, for the, to build the temple. And David made the statement, and by the way, it wasn't just David who prepared it, it was the people who were preparing and, and he said, you know, he said, who am I and who are these people that we should be, be, basically says that we should be privileged to give to such a project as this one. In other words, we don't even, we don't even deserve to contribute to this project. And yet, you know, you've, you've blessed us with the opportunity uh, to contribute to the building of the house of God. Now, in the house of God, he's talking about a physical structure. All right. For us, obviously, the house of God is the church. And our attitude should be the same, that it is, a, it is a blessing and a privilege to be able to give to the greatest institution that has ever, that has ever been established on this earth. You know, Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, uh, uh, um, um, Joel 2, but Mike, uh, I mean, uh, 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 Joel 2, and uh, I believe it's Micah 2, teach that the, that the church is the highest institution that's ever, that's ever been established. There's, there's no institution that exceeds it. Uh, there's none that equals it. And with, you know, with that in mind, you know, we ought to consider it a privilege and honor to be able to contribute uh, to it and to, uh, its, uh, and to its work. All right, um, so there, there's some of the, we'll say the manifestations of reverence, all right? Um, I want to go to the bottom of page 67 over to number 3 because pretty much everything above it is, are things that are just somewhat repetitive things we've already talked about. But the road to recovery of reverence is mapped by two points. And the first, he talks about the process of repentance. And we've talked somewhat about repentance. And at the bottom of page over the top, you know, it, it recognizes the majesty of God uh, it focuses on God-centered worship and living, uh, and it means structuring our worship and lives according to God's directions. We might say uh, invite, uh, divine uh, instruction, and so that's the you know that's the starting point. Now, with regard to where it says going into the section on you know, the body, the body of the lesson here on page sixty-eight, I want to start down toward the bottom uh, again. Everything that's said. From there are things we've talked about. But I think there's some important things for us to consider here at the bottom of page 68 under Roman numeral 2. Um, and that is under letter A, that our modern age has experienced an explosion of words. And man, it, that is just so true. I mean, think about, 
Think about how many words there are or how many words have changed in the last 25 years. Let's just go back a little far. Let's just go back 30 years. Right. Here's a word nobody ever heard of or used 30 years ago. Internet. Internet. Now, how, mu how much has that one word, you know, changed? Yeah. How about Google? You know, that's a company name, which, by the way, is now used as a verb. Go Google it. Google's now gone from a, from a company name to a verb. I, the word text went from being a noun to a verb. Text me that. Whereas text used to be the letters on the, you know, the text was the, the composition. And now we talk about, we talk about message me that. Messenger. I mean, we have, we have all kinds of words that have just exploded in, in, into uh, the public, uh, public square. And, and so, again, sometimes it's new, sometimes those, it's new words but sometimes it's old words that either have added meanings. In other words, there's more definitions, for example, there's more definitions to the word text in the dictionary now than there was 30 years ago because that word has taken on some, some newer meanings. Well, the difficulty is, is, that, is that as words either expand or as, as the vocabulary expands or as the, as the meaning our definition of words expands, words start to lose their distinctiveness. Now look, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. That's always been the case. You know, as languages expand, words change. They, they lose a particular meaning. Uh, 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 for example, I'll just give you an example. Uh, decimate. Decimate. If it says somebody, man, he, they, he decimated him. Well, it means he utterly destroyed him. But the origin of that word simply means one-tenth. One-tenth. And now, and it's gone from meaning one-tenth now to 100%. See, that word's changed. Again, nothing inherently wrong with that. But when we, but the point that John's getting at is, when we use words, we need to use words that people understand. We need to be, uh, you know, even Paul spoke to this and talked about in, in, in the discussion of speaking in tongues. You know, he said, "I want to speak five words that people can understand." That's the most, you know, that's the most important thing. And so, uh, we want to use words properly. Um, and then, and then bottom page 68, that words today have lost the sense of absolute. In other words, a word, again, this is not, I, I don't think John's presenting this as a problem, just as a warning. Just as a warning. Um, but, uh, you know, for example, the word miracle. You know, how, you know, how often does that word get thrown around? You know, and, uh, and, and by the way, when we when we use it in a when we use it in a less specific uh, context, we still all understand what's been talked about, right? You know, you know, you know. It was a miracle catch. You know, it was a miracle comeback. Well, we all know what that means. It means it was something that was extremely unlikely to take place, and yet it did. We might say the odds were against it, and yet you know, and yet it happened. You know. Kid grabs a basketball and heaves it 80 feet as the buzzer goes off and the ball goes in at the other end. You know, it's a miracle shot. Well, it's not a miracle shot, but we all understand what that means. But the difficulty is, is that when we, when we, allow, when we allow words that have specific biblical meanings to take unbiblical meanings, but continue to use them in biblical contexts. You know, because I, I, you know, I've had discussion uh, I'm thinking about one in particular that you know somebody was giving me grief over being, me being a hard case over the word miracle, and, and he said, "Well, people just use it in different ways." I said, "I understand that," I said, "but it doesn't make it right." 
And when you allow people to use what when you allow people to use biblical words improperly, it muddies the water in how they're they're understood in the text. And so your know, words you know, words mean things. Uh, and so there's uh, there's the problem that we always run in that we're gonna continue look. It's a problem now, and it's always going to be a problem. When words change meanings, add meanings, lose meaning, uh, we, you, well, I'll give you another one. And this is in a biblical context. Inspired. Inspired. You, know, you could be talking to a group of, and I'll use the term loosely, theologians. And they say there's 200 of these guys in a room and you say the Bible is inspired. And they might all agree with you, but they might be seven, eight, ten different ideas about what the word inspired means. So you see, it's important for us to, it's important for us to define terms. You know, what do you mean? What do you mean by the Bible is inspired? Do you mean it's inspired like you know, Shakespeare was inspired to, 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 to write you know, to write the plays that he wrote? Is he inspired the way that the, the founders were inspired to write the Declaration of Independence or, or the or the Constitution of the United States? Or or do you mean so, or do you mean do you mean it's it's an inspirational thing? Well, none of the above. You know, when the Bible speaks about being when the Bible speaks of itself as being inspired, the word there means God breathed. In other words, when we say the Bible's inspired, we mean every word in this book came from God. Every word in this book came from God. And as coming from God, there are some things, there are some things that are necessarily attached to that. And first of all, or first and foremost is, it's infallible. If the, you know, if, the Bible, if the Bible came from God, then the Bible does not contain any, it doesn't contain any mistakes, right? It doesn't contain any uh, um, um, errors with regard to, and we can just run it again. It doesn't contain any errors in regard to history. It doesn't contain any errors in regard to geography. It doesn't contain any errors in regard to science. You know, everything, everything we read in this Bible is true. It's true. And so when I believe the Bible is inspired, I believe that it doesn't have any mistakes in it. Also, when I say the Bible is inspired, I mean that it's inspired and there's nothing else beside it that is inspired. When I say the Bible is inspired, I'm also, def I'm also limiting inspiration to the Bible itself. The Book of Mormon is not inspired. You know, any particular catechism or book of discipline, no translation is inspired. By the way, there's a, there are a host of people out there that think the King James is an inspired version of the Bible. They think it's inspired. They think that God gave us the King James Version of the Bible. And that's why a lot of people are King James only. It's the only inspired, it's the only inspired translation. Well, that's a problem, you know, that's a problem as well. And so, and so, you know, the word inspiration means not only is the Bible from God, it doesn't have any mistakes, and that anything other than the Bible is of, of necessity not inspired. So whatever book somebody, you know, the Koran is not inspired, the Book of Mormon is not inspired, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, uh, you know, uh, Whatever Ellen G. White or the Jehovah's Witnesses put out is not inspired. It's not inspired, and as being uninspired, it's fallible. It's subject to being. It's subject to being wrong. But it, again, it goes. It goes to the point of the words that we use need to mean things, and we need to understand uh, what those words mean. And then, then ultimately, and I'll close with this: is that. When we, when we understand uh, these terms properly, we also understand that the Bible cannot be the product of a human mind. Human beings could not have constructed the Bible purely of human wisdom and human device. I mean, there, there, there are 
For God. There are things that are in the Bible that no man could know. You know, for example, there are things in the book of Job, which, by the way, is the oldest book of the Bible. In other words, the, 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 the book itself is, is generally almost unanimously agreed. It's the oldest book of the Bible. And there are things in that list of questions that God asked Job that no man could have thought of those questions. It, it, it wasn't possible for the human mind to even ask the questions because God is asking Job some things that no man can know and that he alone can know. So that, that tells you what? It came from the mind of God. It came, it, it, it came from God's mind. And so... Uh, and so we understand that the Bible cannot be the product of human wisdom. It cannot be, it cannot be the product of, of, of any human uh, design. Even though humans were the instruments through whom the Bible was given, we still understand the origin of the Bible uh, is, is divine. All right, so with that in mind, I'm going to stop right there. And I, because this next section on page 69 on, it, it, it is on how to hear God's Word. And so I don't, want to, I don't want to start on that. That's a big section. And I, I, I'll do my best tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll do my best next Lord's Day to finish this lesson on, uh, on how to hear God's Word, starting on page 69 uh, through the end of this chapter on page 76.